I first met our speaker and his lovely wife, Penny, when I graduated from Hillsdale College and went out to Claremont to study for my PhD in political science. At the time, he was president of the Claremont Institute, a position he held for 15 years before coming uh, to Hillsdale. Uh, what we graduate students quickly learned about him is the same thing Hillsdale students uh, today learn about him. Uh, at heart, he's a teacher. Uh, he's always teaching. Something else we learned about him is that, like all good teachers, if you claim to know something in his presence, it makes you something of a ripe target. Uh, the goal of education is, after all, the discovery of truth. Uh, sometimes uh, students get that wrong, and it has to be pointed out. That happened to me, at least, uh, quite frequently. Uh, well, I urge you to visit the Hillsdale campus and sit in on one of his classes or go with him to the uh, student union and have lunch with him and some Hillsdale students. And what you'll see is he hasn't changed a bit. Uh, at Hillsdale, he teaches courses on various topics, including uh, the Constitution, Aristotle, C.S. Lewis, and others. Uh, he's the author of several books, including the best-selling Churchill's Trial, Winston Churchill, and The Salvation of Free Government. Uh, it's been my privilege and honor to work with him at Hillsdale for almost 20 years now. Uh, his topic today is politics and education. Would you please welcome back to the podium the 12th president, of Hillsdale College, uh, Larry Piarn. Thank you, Dan. Thank you all for being here. By the way, wasn't that wild? Did you, did you understand what he said, he did, at the beginning of his speech? We have asked him here, to Hillsdale College to present you to him to you, our guest, and we're kind of a big deal. And his first step was to audit us. <laughs> Great, yeah, okay. Be careful, don't ask him over to your house. <laughs> it's hilarious. I, we, for years, we don't anymore because now we have our own lawyer, which costs more money. Um, but we used to keep a lawyer in Washington, and the job was to keep them, to keep the federal government from giving us any money, because they do, you know, they would, in a heartbeat. Okay, so welcome. Uh, I'm looking for the provost, but I don't see him. Okay. I'm going to give a great man an honorary degree sometime this morning, and when he shows up, I'm just going to give it to him, <laughs> and you'll like the story. Okay. So, um, last night I said that uh, we're schizophrenic at the college because uh, so much is going right and so much threatens to go wrong. And I'm going to explain why I think that is, what's going on in the world that makes all this. Uh, I'll start with a quote from Churchill, because you know he was a very great man. In the May of 1938, you know, think what was going on in the world in May of 1938. In October the Mu of 38, the Munich Agreement was made. In March of 39, Hitler took the rest of Czechoslovakia, just having signed a, a, an agreement not to do it. In September of 1939, the big war started. And the speech, here they are. What are you doing here? <laughs> Excuse us, we, we will be back to you eventually. <laughs> okay, so. There is a man. <laughs> he started a company, uh, the Friendly Ice Cream Company in 1931 with his brother, Curtis. He lives in Connecticut. Where he lives is like everything about him. He's a builder. Uh, 
The most important thing he's done in his life is marry his wife, Helen, who is herself a chemistry teacher and a highly educated woman and trustee of many uh, nonprofits. And I can tell you, sharp as a tack. And together in uh, Summers, Connecticut, they have 100 and some acres and they've turned it into a paradise of woods and trails and lakes. And he's always building more lakes. He likes lakes. The ones he's got, he's always digging them deeper. And there's seven wonderful structures on this. And the greatest of them is an exact replica of Monticello, made from bricks, dug in the same place Thomas Jefferson got his a great act of love for no other reason than it would be a great thing to do and he wanted to celebrate his 100th birthday. Well, he's celebrating his 105th birthday by giving all that to Hillsdale College. I'm pleased to report that neither one of them heard what I just said. <laughs> so I said that you're a great man, and I told them what you've done, and I told them that, you, that she's a better woman than you are a man. He wants everybody to know that I am wearing his wedding band in his recent weakness. He became fearful and he wanted to make sure that his wedding band didn't end up in the grave with him. So he worked for two days to get it off <laughs> behind my back. <laughs> and now I am wearing it because he wants his ring and my ring that he gave me are always going to be together. Say some things. Uh, I would, yes. Okay. okay, now, before I give them what I'm going to give them with you as all witnesses, uh, Helen Blake is going to say a few words. Huh. Huh. You can come up here if you want to, wherever you yeah. want. Yeah, okay. This is a great day for us. This is a great honor. And we are extremely appreciative, more so than any other honor we have yet received, because we feel that this is the most important thing that we've ever done. So I'll tell you what the what is and what the why is. The what is, oh, and by the way, Years and years ago, at the ceremony where I received a master's degree, the speaker was, who was that funny guy? <laughs> oh gosh, it'll come to me later on, I'll let you know. But anyway, um, he's a great speaker. Afterwards, he took a whole bunch of us over to the new natatorium that he had just donated to Springfield College in Springfield, Massachusetts. And he said, here, ladies and gentlemen, is the price of a doctorate at Springfield College. <laughs> so, so here is the what that is the price of a doctorate at Hillsdale. Uh, we have a 
property in, in uh, Summers, Connecticut, which is 77 acres in Connecticut and then another 10 just over the line in Massachusetts. It's a beautiful property. Press created it out of um, a field and some trees. And there's a granite house at the, t the highest part on the property. And there are eight ponds and there are trails crisscrossing. There's a beautiful pool, not anywhere right near the house because press thought that would spoil the whole atmosphere of the place. So it's, it's a pastoral setting. And every year he had to, during the summer, build something. Sometimes it was a, a little building, he loves architecture. And sometimes it was an engineering project to get the water running in the right places down to the bottom of the hill. And then, when he was 98 years old, this, the estate just north of us became available. And he decided that if he could get it for a price that was reasonable enough, he would like to build his last project. Well, I'd heard that a million times. <laughs> but anyway, my mouth dropped open when he said what it was. He wanted to build an, a, a replica of Thomas Jefferson's Monticello. He said, I won't do it unless you're all on board. Well, I had never said no to him yet. <laughs> and then he said, and how much are you willing to lose? <laughs> well, we built it in a record 14 months. He had the guys, our guys, out there building a new trail going into the back of the Monticello property, or what was going to be Monticello. And they were working on the, on the site before we ever owned the property. <laughs> so. <laughs> Anyway, it's built and it is gorgeous. And when Larry Arn came to look at our property and we took him over to take a look at Monticello, I could see the wheels turning in his head. <laughs> <laughs> well, I and Press thought a long time about what we wanted to happen to our property because all these years, we've shared it with our neighbors. We have kids fishing in our ponds. The kids um, ice skate, play hockey on those ponds in the wintertime. We have people riding their horses through. Our neighbors walk their dogs on the trails. So we wanted to be able to preserve it. We were afraid that no matter what, once we lost control of it, they'd come in and, and somebody would come in and build a development. So that was one thing. The next thing was we really wanted it to do something good. And so one of my pet projects is in recent years has been learning from the original documents because as you know, our education system hasn't been doing too well about preserving our values. And higher education isn't exactly high anymore. It's hard to consider it high when the big issue is which bathroom to use. <laughs> so, or if you have to have safe spaces to protect you from ideas that don't sync with your own. <laughs> so we thought maybe we could do something to make the property usable for um, retreats, seminars, our our daughter and son-in-law over here also have put their property in, and they have a, a beautiful house. They're both artists, 
and uh, there's a big art studio over the garage that'd be a perfect place for uh, seminars. But anyway, it was Susan's idea, that's my daughter, that we look into Hillsdale. And so we did and realized that because they don't take any government money and because Larry Honor is their leader <laughs> and, and because they have stuck with their principles over all these years, we had the best chance of preserving what we wanted to be our legacy if we turned it all over to Hillsdale. And so that's the what and the why. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I don't have to talk. I was going to tell some very really nice things about you. Yeah, you don't have to. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, s step out here, Wayne. Not, not, not you yet. Wayne, come out here. I, I want you to meet this guy because he, he takes care, Wayne Dumas, and he takes care of the, of, the, uh, of the Blakes, and he's an inspiring man. And he was, for many years, the head of the prison guards at a big prison near Summers, Connecticut. And so I'm hoping, although I haven't persuaded him yet, that he's eventually going to be our dean of men. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, it's a high security prison. <laughs> That's where the and the murderers are. <laughs> Helen just told me she was disappointed that you stood up to applaud when you did because she was about to say something great about me. And now you'll, you'll never know what it is. <laughs> I just have one little story about this. I, I, uh, you know, we don't, we didn't know these people. And they called up and it was just awesome, you know, right from the start. And I go over there, and uh, we finally get John Savini, uh, talks to him, and he comes up and tells me about this, and you know, we only half know what to make of it. And so we go over to Connecticut and do course, and we meet them. And he is 105 right now. And he's, he's, he's ailing a little bit, but what he was like, and will be again like, is full of life and interest, and he just bubbles over, right? And so he built that Monticello, and then he sold it to a guy, because he wanted the pleasure of building it for it to be there. And he takes it, and it's right, right down from his house, their house, and, I, and so we go in and we look at that thing, you know, <laughs> it's just really great. And I see that the guy has got wedding pictures up from his daughter getting married there, and I said, you know, I'm never going to get hold of this house, which I had already formed the intention to do. <laughs> and we go out, and we go outside, and Press said, well, did you like that? And I said, like it? I want it. <laughs> the next day, he bought it back. <laughs> so... There's, there's a thousand reasons why it's right to do this here today. And one of them is, you're all going to be invited to seminars in Monticello. And it'll knock your sock. Now, it is a fact that the city council of, my, of Summers, Connecticut, is not as enthusiastic as they might be about our... <laughs> and um, <laughs> and uh, I think all that's going to be okay because... There is some semblance of the rule of law remaining in America. And, uh, and we're stubborn and we'll keep at it. And also, we'll be really great neighbors for them. It's a beautiful little town. And they, they want the property kept as it is. And I just ask you, you know, we had our board meeting on Wednesday. And as we do every time, we began with a reading from the 1844 Articles of Association. 
It's the contract with the state of Michigan that gives rise to Hillsdale College. We can't change it on our own. It's the law. We keep the law. If we keep that law, then that makes us most likely to be able to keep this law, and we will keep it. And we thank you. I can't find the words I'm supposed to say, but I have them memorized, I think, because I've said them many times. On behalf of the faculty and Board of Trustees, no, on behalf of the faculty of Hillsdale College and with the authority of its Board of uh, Trustees, I confer on Press and Helen Blake the title Doctors of Public Service. The bald guy is uh, one of our greatest professors and the provost of the college, a chemistry professor, Chris Van Orman. It's a lot better than hearing me blather on, wasn't it? <laughs> so I'm going to make a few points really fast, and then you can ask questions or say something if you want to, or else we'll have lunch. Um, I was going to quote at length Winston Churchill about what's going on in the world, because he is the greatest statesman to live in our time, the time of the vast power of science and its use to try to manage sci uh, uh, society scientifically. It's a new kind of thing, and I'll explain to you what it is. But it's uh, dangerous. It is the danger. And it's been growing for 100 years all over the world. It's not hard to recognize it. It starts with a simple idea. Uh, and by the way, what Adam said was such great force and eloquence. And I, I meant what I said. That guy is crazy. <laughs> he, uh, that stuff is born in two things that are and, and what I'm gonna what I want to illustrate is a difference of temper and outlook. Something fundamental has changed in the way we think, especially the way people who govern, people who are in authority, people who are elite think. And and the two things are they feel entitled by a different qualification than our consent to rule. They, they, don't, they, they think that they know. They think that they have training and expertise. And then the second thing is a byproduct, and that is once you start trying to run everything the way we run it now, it gets terribly complicated. And that is just a, a uh, petri dish for graft. And, and the sense of entitlement that's behind it is the reason it can run rampant. And, and by the way, your reaction to his speech and to the, and the effectiveness of his organization, they are a testament to the fact that the battle is not over yet. Uh, here, here's what you have to uh, see. Uh, the word science comes from the Latin word to know. Knowing is the highest human activity. Uh, Aristotle's Metaphysics, which, you know, it's a difficult book, I confess it, but it's a very inspiring book. 
You should read it. Uh, the first line is, the human soul stretches itself out to know. It's the reason schools work. It, you know, if you just know what to do, right, start on the assumption they want to know. And start on the assumption that they want to know things of lasting importance. And all of a sudden, you then realize the learning is in them. And so the age of science, that's a Latin word, that's the age where knowing is a big thing. And it doesn't just mean the natural sciences. Although beholding the world, one of Chris Van Orman's colleagues, a, a physicist, Ken Hayes, gave an inspiring convocation talk. And uh, I, I mean, it, uh, you, you can see it on our website. If you have trouble finding it, I'll send you a link. And he, he did this PowerPoint. And it, these incredibly dramatic photographs. And it, it navigated between big physics, gravitational physics, the movement of the planets, the, all that, and teeny little physics, quantum mechanics. And at one point, he shows us a photograph, because you know the Milky Way is very beautiful. And it, you can see very fine pictures of it. But now we have pictures of what's on the other side of it. It's, be it's better. And you just see that. And Ken Hayes, it's, uh, it just shows his soul is in good order. He, he put that up there, and everybody at the convocation, you know, 1,500 of us or so, we just all stop and stare at that, ah, uh, you know. And he does. And he's a sophisticated, you know, very experienced physicist. He sees the beauty of that thing. And just to see that thing is worthwhile. It's an end, not a means. And also, the experience of seeing it elevates one. That's what science is, what it's supposed to be. Now, technology is a very different set of words. Logos is reason, it's what we can do. Uh, in the beginning was the word, that word for word in John 1.1 1, 1 is logos. Uh, techne is art or making. Can you see making and knowing are different things? Making is very valuable, but it can never be anything except inferior to the thing that it makes. Somebody made the chair. The chair is very useful. They wouldn't have undertaken the activity of making the chair, except they want the chair. The chair calls the activity into being. And you can just see there's just a chain of being goes right up and Making is at the bottom of the chain. It has to be there, it's just logical. Except now what we think is technology is the most important thing, making, and we don't look anymore, as much at least, at the things to behold, the things to know. The reason to make a telescope is so you can see. Seeing is good. So that reversal, it's just a little thing. And yet it's liberated vast movements. Uh, the people who invented the new kind of government in America, that was actually invented by more older and more fundamental thinkers, especially in Germany, in the early 19th century in America, it comes in the late 19th century. They said, look at all this progress of science. They don't mean science beholding, they mean technology. And if we see all this progress, we could, uh, we could uh, use it to perfect the society. We can have more power. We can arrange things more systematically. Now, already there's a problem that they didn't stop and think about. If you just want, in our Constitution reader, representative and fundamentally important papers and speeches by many of these people, Woodrow Wilson, Herbert Crowley, Frank Goodnow, John Dewey, you'll see, you'll find in there that the, what's not in the speeches is what's all over, for example, Plato and Aristotle. Yeah, we have power, we humans. The hard question is, how should we use it? Or to put it in the Socratic term, what is the good? That's not their question. They never ask that question. They, they ask instead, how can we use more power? And the ability to do that 
becomes a title to rule. If you're the one who knows the scientific way to organize a society, you can rule in the name of that. And that's not the same as ruling by consent of the governed. And so then some practical changes start coming, and they start coming in a hurry, and they follow inevitably. And they're just radically different from the way before. Uh, one of the reasons that, uh, uh, you know, very principled people in good, of good principle in politics don't see the right thing to do is because they don't really know anything except this, this way of governing we have now that has prevailed for 70 years, 60 years. And that's two generations. That means nobody's seen it, right? Uh, you would have to read books an un unusual activity. <laughs> Scientific planners in this new way gain authority. Power shifts from elected officials to tenured professionals. You know, I believe, uh, Adam didn't deny it, but, but uh, there's an implication you could draw from what he said that we have to control Congress. I don't think so. I think we have to make it accountable again. That means it should make the laws, and we should fire them if we don't like the laws they make, because the laws are now made by people to, who are simply unaccountable. Uh, it's a shocking fact that Last year, the Congress passed about the same number of laws it did in 1850 and every year since then, about 100 to 150 a year. But the number of laws is a great multiple of that. You know, the last year of Obama, they added 80,000 pages to the Federal Register, a record, fewer since he's gone. But that, where did those laws come from? The answer is kind of hard to say because there are 150 rulemaking agencies in the federal government, and it's not possible for any elected official by himself to govern what they do. And the Congress, divided almost always, effectively they cannot. All that's in the name of expertise. We need expert agencies for transportation, for airports, for schools, for everything right? And they make rules. They have rulemaking processes. And they make them by the, by the not, not by the score, they make them by the tens of thousands, all the time. Another thing changes. These agencies, and all of this, by the way, is because we want more expertise in the government. See? I'll, I'll quote one, Winston Churchill. I got a bunch of them, but I'm not going to say them. But I'll quote this one. Churchill says, and one of the most important things he ever said is little noticed, he said, in this house, he's talking about the House of Commons, his beloved place, there is no room for expertise. We rule by common sense, English, British worthies representative of a people with common sense. And that means if a thing cannot be reduced to common sense, and it has to be, you know, like, nuclear bombs, right? Uh, although Van Orman could probably build a nuclear bomb, the rest of us can't. He then, if he's doing that, has to report directly to someone elected because that's a very great power. And the whole question about politics is you have to have government. How do you control it, right? You have to empower it. You have to. You also have to control it. And consent of the governed is the key tool. And that, I'm saying, is what's breaking down here. Now, these agencies, because they're expert agencies over their purview, and, and it's significant to see that they each have a discrete purview, but there's enough of them that they have purview over everything. And they, because they're experts, they don't only make the regulations, the legislative power, they enforce the regulations. That's the executive power. If one of them finds you or penalizes you, you can sue them. 
You have to sue them in front of a judge that works for them. Right? In 1979, 78, sometime in our history, uh, we, the, Depart the Department of Edu Health, Education, and Welfare, it was, you know, named us out by name and said that if our students were going to have the student loans, which they don't have anymore, it's the only federal money we ever took, but we took the view that that was aid to the students. And then when they write us a letter, we wouldn't answer it. You know, who the, who the devil are they? And, you know, if they don't like what the students are doing with the money, well, they got a contract with the students. That's what we thought, right? And so they decided, the Carter administration, they decided, no, you have to do everything we say, right? There were public threats that they would co close down any college. And, uh, and it, they didn't do it, right? So eventually we sued them. And we sued them in Denver, Colorado. Why? The Department of Education, Health, Education, and Welfare was in Washington, D.C. We're in Hillsdale, Michigan. So they, they moved the whole thing out to Denver just to cost us more money. And we had to sue in front of a judge that worked for them. And then in a miraculous development, we won. <laughs> and of course, they then immediately sued us in federal court. So you got to do it all over again, right? <laughs> Legislative, executive, and judicial. What, what, is, what, is the, what gives the Constitution of the United States its structure? What do the clauses say? Congress, led, uh, uh, executive, judicial, states, uh, ratification process, amendment process, Final transition. There's seven, and each one's about some necessary function divided by the levels and parts and branches of government. That just gets collapsed now. That's the first consequence, right? Now, these people are very powerful in their purview, dang near all powerful. Very hard to stop them. Very hard to stop them if you're the President of the United States or anybody. The second consequence, they make so many laws now. And just remember what I said, the Congress is actually incapable of making so many laws. When Adam said about the productivity of Congress that they only uh, uh, meet for 800 days or whatever he said, my immediate <laughs> hours, 800 hours, my immediate reaction was just good, cut it in half. <laughs> But, but these agencies are just, you know, they're just running and they make, and that, that's why it becomes possible for everything to be regulated the way it is. In schools, right, there, there's a federal curriculum down to the unit plan. Right now, not enforceable directly through many states that, that, that and see, the bureaucratic system there are 23 million people working for the government of the United States, about 21 million in state and local, and about two and a half million or something in federal. I bet Adam knows all these numbers. And, but, but, and that used to be, you know, most government was local, except now it's part of a unified, top-down system where money and authority pass back and forth, authority mostly down. And so you've got this unified system you know, I, I have the vice of motorcycle riding, and I wrote an article 25 years ago in National Review, because if you ride motorcycles, I mean, it's really stupid, but, um, <laughs> but it's also cool. And, you know, and, and I grew up in a little town, and I, I never noticed it before, but when you go through on the back roads and through a little town, there's almost always a building that looks different than the other buildings. And I began to notice it, and then I began to think about my little town. And the thing that used to be one of the banks had become a federal agency. It's called the Black River Area Development Corporation. I don't know what that thing does. I never have. It's been there since I was a boy. About the time I went off to college. See, that's right. So, you know, I went to college in 72. All that had started to grow in 65 and on after that. And then now, they're, now they take over the old hospital. They're huge. And what do they do? There's a federal agency 
in every town. And there wasn't for, what, 1789 to 170 years. There was none. And then there was all of a sudden, and now they're everywhere. A guy fixed my motorcycle in Billings, Montana, and I'd pass by the big federal building there, and I said, uh, his name is Gunder McCombs. You go to the Billings Yamaha shop, you can meet him. He's a great man. And he saved my bacon. <laughs> Our uh, motorcycles had broken down, and uh, we were in Montana, and uh, finally got this guy on the phone, and he said, I gotta get out there. He said. It's getting close to dark. And I said, is that bad? And he said, well, you're on the Crow Reservation and it's dangerous after night. So I get back to my buddy, Bruce Sanborn, a trustee of the college, and he said, what'd he say? And I said, I said we're 10 miles from the Little Bighorn and we have an Indian problem. <laughs> <That's good. laughs> He came and saved us, but then he worked on my motorcycle all day the next day, and I stood around and talked to him, and I said, What's, what happens over there? And he said, ah, nobody knows what happens over there, but I'm glad it's there. And I said, why are you glad it's there? And he said, uh, he said, my treat, I'm going to be rich, working six hours, six days a week, 14 hours a day in my motorcycle business. I'm going to be rich, and I'm going to be rich in exactly eight years. I saw him in 10 years, and I said, Gunder, are you rich? And he said, I am, you know? He had his inventory, he knew how long it'd take him to pay it off, you know? And uh, anyway, he's an awesome guy. And he said, but my one indulgence is, he says, every two years I buy a new truck, and I shop for them over in that parking lot. And I said, why do you do that? And he said, because they've got all the best trucks over there, <laughs> all those federal employees, right? So that's a, and just remember, that's a force, right? It's important, and it's grown. Now, the system that I'm describing, that system prevails in roughly this form from Beijing to Washington to Paris to Moscow, right? It's the global phenomenon. And once it started, it's never been stopped. Now, in America, it's very hard to stop it because the system consumes, you know, if you count the regulatory cost, about 52 or 3% of the economy. That means half the money we encounter is connected to that, touched by that, influenced by that. And that changes the constitutional proportions in a very serious way because, you know, I, I, you probably see me do this, I do it all the time, but there's a, imagine America's a big old circle and everything in it's, everything in America is inside the circle. And then imagine a little circle that's 10% of the whole, and that's the government, because that's about the historic percentage of the government to the rest of the economy. And then there's this unique thing. Madison says this in the 63rd Federalist. He says, this is the most important thing about the Constitution and the key innovation. If you want to understand the Constitution, start with this. Almost nobody knows this, too, except you take our online courses. So all of the sovereign power is located out in the big circle. And that's never happened before. No class of lords and ladies, no tycoons, no hereditary monarchs, no warrior class with political power, just all of us. We're sovereign. We have legitimate power to rule. That's the first step. But the second step is equally important. We delegate all of our power to rule. We don't do anything directly ourselves except elections. We delegate all our power to rule to the little circle. And that means between elections, we can't do anything, which teaches us to think before we act. And it means that the people who can do things all the time are entirely beholden to us. That's the first step in the structure of the Constitution of the United States and the decisive and also, according to James Madison, unique step, America's contribution to constitutional government, the greatest. 
It actually achieves what Aristotle was after, which was a mixed regime. That is to say, take all the warriors and all the rich people and all the well-born and take the many and sort of get power from all of them and mix them all up. That'll be more stable, he thought. Well, all the power comes from us, but it's delegated in different ways and at different times into that little circle. That's America, right? And it's the reason, you know, the principles of America are extremely important in the way that a final cause, the ultimate purpose of anything, is extremely important to understanding it. But the how it works, the form, the look of it, right? That's what that is, right? Now, all you got to do to see what this change means is if you just take that big circle and then take the little circle and make it more than half the whole. Now, all of a sudden, the little circle is very powerful. Except it's not that little anymore. And there's some common interest among them, right? Because although these agencies are separate from one another, they represent the same kind of thing. And they get their power from that thing, and their station from that thing, and their money from that thing. And so there's our constitutional crisis. And as I say, and I, I want you to know, when Winston Churchill was, eight, was 24 years old in 1898, he wrote his first thing about this, 18, 26 years old. He, so 24 years old. He, sorry, sorry. He wrote his first thing about this. And he never stopped writing about it. He understood it. He, he understood that the same awesome power in human ha hands that makes war potentially destructive of everything also makes administration potentially destructive of everything. That's why it's so hard to hold it to account. It's why you have to be a kind of a, a genius wild man to do it, you know? Thank God for him, but he's a nut. And, <laughs> I salute you. I'm a nut, too. Now, now, you know, first of all, these things in the calculus of nature, in the, in the way things work, it follows. There is a tremendous danger right now. This has all come to such a head, and it just goes with it. Inseparably, there's a tremendous opportunity, too. Because, you know, people don't like this. They never have. Now, it, it goes, can't be stopped, it seems. But where is it popular? Where does anybody, where does bureaucratic government enjoy wide pu public support anywhere? Where is it ever? Never in America. It's the reason left and right, people are kind of interested in what he has to say. And many of them support it even on the left. You know, the, the ones who are eating out of that specific rice, rice bowl, Matthew told me earlier, they're the ones that won't go along, right? But most people are not like that. And so I think this, I think, you know, first of all, have you noticed, I mean, you know, it's uh, everything's up in the air right now, right? The political coalitions are shifting. We don't know how far they'll shift or if they'll continue to shift or if they'll stay shifted, but we do know that the Republican president sitting now is weaker in the suburbs and stronger in the inner city than Republicans typically are. We know that the governor of this state was elected by 45,000 votes, and we know that the exit polls say, now they're not perfectly reliable, but they indicate something, say that he got 60,000 more votes from black women than any Republican has recorded to have received. And he got them by going to charter and, and, and voucher schools and saying, what's just a simple fact, they're gonna take away your school. And they did that in the inner city. Think of this, you know, how many, how many of us have engaged in talk of the dependent class? Uh, you know, because there is a kind of long-term dependent class in America. Well, some have made the terrible mistake, and I am glad that I have never referred to the 47% who won't vote for us because they're on the dole. Somebody said that one time. Not good. Those people are going back to work, right? 
turns out they're human. They would rather live of their own. Right? They, you know, we've got some, in our charter schools, I think the latest number is 43% of our charter schools are members of racial minorities. And you know, they, uh, if you include the girls in the schools, they're all, 90% of them are part of the overall 90% minority of America. <laughs> it, uh, but you know, what? when we first started doing this, you know, and you can, you know, they're easier to do in the suburbs usually, but somebody said, well, you know, there's no parent structure in the inner city. And I said, there's gotta be something. And they said, why? And I said, because if there's a five-year-old alive, somebody loves that kid. Just go find that person, right? That's happening. I think there's something, and you know, I pray for that, right? I'd give up votes in the suburbs to get that. Why? It unites the country, and it gives everybody a chance to what, do what they want, which is to live a fully human life. Raise your kids. Be responsible. I think that uh, I went and talked to the vice president the other day, so I know him. I've known him a long time. And uh, I got all fired up and lectured him. And, uh, <laughs> you know, his, his specific greatness is he humors me. <laughs> Lord knows what he says when I leave. But uh, I said, just remember, you know, Who's the proper sovereign of education? Sovereignty is properly located in the school. The school. What's in the school? The children and the parents and the teachers. A community of love, right? I can just tell you, I'm a teacher, right? It's a pain in the butt. It's just the most wonderful thing, you know? And like the greatest teacher in America, uh, I wish my daughter were here. Uh, I've, uh, there's a woman in Leander, Texas, and I've turned her into a tourist attraction. She's the kindergarten teacher at the Leander Classical Academy, Mrs. Raritan. And, uh, you know, I've published about her. She's very proud, although she, you know, checks my grammar. And, uh, and, and this woman, you know, it's just, they're little wigglers. Have you ever been in a kindergarten class? I mean, it's hopeless. When my kids were that age, I turned to my wife one time and I said, this is like having dinner with a bucket of snakes. <laughs> and she gets them to learn and it's magical. And they're exhausted at the end of the day because they have given their all because it's the greatest thing they can do. You see, and Mrs. Raritan, she can do that. And you can't put on a form how to do that, see? She doesn't need any help. We help her, right? How do we help her? Well, you know, we got a bunch of fancy pants knowledge and we're teachers. So, you know, if you wanna know something about physics or you wanna know something about literature or something about history, we got people who really know that. And the teachers love to hear from those people. We don't try to teach the students, they can do it better than we can. And we mostly learn from them the best ways to reach the students of their age groups because they do it and they're humans and they can do it and it's their love, you see. And that means it follows as a simple deduction. We have to keep our hope about this no matter how this election goes, right? Sooner or later, or as Churchill used to say, sooner or later and sooner and later. It's just a fact. People love to learn and they love to have their lives in their own hands, and they love their children, and they should have control of those things. And so what I said to the Veep was, I said, you should tr go try to get the teachers to vote for you, and the parents, because they're living beneath a bureaucracy. It's a scandal that more than half the employees of the public schools are not teachers. In our charter schools, the ratio is eight to one or six to one at the worst in favor of the teachers. And what do those others do? First of all, they eat up way more than half the money. And second, they tell the teachers what to do. The verb they use for teaching now is delivery. 
And what they try to teach in education schools, by the way, which have power of law behind them, because in many states you need a certification from them to teach in a public school. I am not qualified to teach the Constitution or Winston Churchill or Aristotle in the Michigan public schools. I'm proud, right? <laughs> because what do you have to do? You have to learn methods that they prescribe from the top down. And you may say, reaching all the way up to the Secretary of Education, that's not where it reaches up to. It reaches up to the elevated halls of, of Harvard and such places. See, and, and you know, the research one university is the strongest single force in America today because it controls so much of everything. He did those studies, right? They're just rolling dough. But power is more important. You know, Machiavelli said money goes to power, not the other way around. That money goes there because those people are strong. To expose them is a way of making them weaker. So I'll just conclude. It's, we have the privilege of living in a moment of great turning, for good or ill. I don't agree with one thing the speaker said last night. The truth of this is not going to be found in the middle. Lincoln says uh, he was always pushed to find a compromise. And I will tell you, he and Winston Churchill would compromise almost anything to avoid war, because they knew its horrors. But he said, a man who is half slave and half free is, not, is like a man who's neither a living nor a dead man. And you're not likely to run across it. X and not X cannot be compromised. Either all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That's what the fight's about right now. It's a fight for everything. And so I end with my eternal action plan. Learn and teach others, and that will save the world. Thank you.